Thank you. Um, so I've been asked to talk about how S&T support to train advise assist. To be honest, it's, it's quite difficult to really, um, you know, have those firm lines between where the um, technological developments in DST groups stop in terms of supporting more conventional type operations and, and TA, but I've done my best. Um, what I'll do is to go through some of our past key successes. Um, I'm only going back, uh, just Jeff mentioned earlier, should I go back to the Vietnam War? I've only gone back to 2009. I think that's quite far enough. Um, but I want to actually you know, put a fairly positive spin on, on, on what we have achieved. Um, then I'll go through what we're doing at the moment in terms of our, our current level investment, which in my view is really quite low and sort of get to a point where we can discuss where to from here. And I'll go through some of the drivers which can perhaps, and mechanisms um, which can be leveraged to really drive um, DST work in this area going forwards. Because as I say, I think at the moment it is quite a, quite a low level of investment. Um, there was a point made yesterday that perhaps my comments were construed as, um, before lunch yesterday as, as DST looking for um, work. Um, that's not the case in my view. Um, DST Group has gone through a significant um, downsizing over the last three years by between 20 and 25 per cent in our staffing levels. Um, and also, I think, if anything, work levels have actually increased over that time, especially our, in terms of our external engagement. Um, now, when you, when you look at the white paper, there's a um, significant increase um, coming in terms of major capability acquisition. So we're sort of competing against that because we have a, a mandatory role to conduct technical risk aspects of capability development. But also, as our portfolio funding has reduced over the last several years, major projects bring significant funding with them. So our funding model almost biases us towards supporting major projects. So that is, that is, the, the, that is the competing aspect here to really try and push driving more focus onto, onto these types of TAA and SFA um, capabilities. Um, so in terms of, if I go back to 2009, in terms of operational valuation, um, so this is an area, sort of a key area of, of, of ongoing expertise, certainly within my group. Um, we've, we've done, you know, at a, at a time when defence really needed a way to, to improve their measurement of, of overall progress in its operational objectives, um, the campaign assessment project involved the development of an operational planning evaluation framework, which was designed to render explicit theories of change, assumptions and risks associated with campaign plans, as well as develop uh, specific measures and indicators for progress of operations. So those, that, that framework has been built into to the, to the high level doctrine in this space. Uh, we've, we've provided support to to my understanding, all SFA operations in terms of the monitoring and evaluation um, since 2009. So it is a significant area for us over that period. Um, move on to the next slide. So this this project, um, this Red Wing program, is in my from my limited analysis, is the only example of DST technology development that has led to technology <coughs> transfer to support indigenous capability building. Um, it is a series of innovative projects that have been developed within the Australian De Department of Defence as the first of a kind specialised IED force protection systems for expert to selected uh, partner security forces, namely the Afghan army and, and police. Um, so it's a, it's a really good example where DST Group has worked collaboratively with defence industry, the AM, MSO as well as IPDIV to, to really deliver a positive outcome where we have um, transferred that technology to to an Indigenous partner. Um, as mentioned there, over 160,000 units were produced for the Afghan army have been um, distributed. My understanding it's been a very successful project. I guess the point here is that this is the only example of technology transfer to an Indigenous um, a force that I am aware of from, you know, from technology which has been developed within our organisation. Um, the cultural compatibility study was conducted in 2012. Um, it's a, it was a significant study. Um, it was a longitudinal assessment of relationships between the Afghan, uh, Afghan National Army and the ADF mentoring task forces that lived, worked, uh, and worked together. Um, it was conducted uh, with partner um, operations with their Afghan counterparts. Um, it was conducted in three phases with three successive ADF forces over an 18 month period involved the deployment of civilian social scientists to Afghanistan to collect observations and anecdotes from over 2,000 ADF and Afghan, pers Afghan personnel. Um, during this period uh, of the study, during the period of the study, 
The uh, relationships between local and international forces in Afghanistan deteriorated sharply due to insider attacks, and that led to significant follow-on work, which I'll talk about next. Um, so namely the pre-deployment training um, and mental selection. Um, Candy will be talking to aspects of this in the next presentation, so I'll go through this very quickly, but um, key aspects of the training include the use of role players across a number of scenarios, the deliberate um, creation of stressful environments to improve the sort of memorable aspects of those situations, um, to really prepare the mentor and advisors for their operational environment. Um, another part of this was the development of a interpersonal sustainability matrix to really support the selection of personnel for advisor roles. Um, in 2015, there was a OA study done on the train advisory and assistance mission in Afghanistan. Um, this was a, a, a uh, flyaway team which, which conducted interviews, focus groups, a survey and direct observations from the uh, personnel involved. Um, as you can see, the, the key insights from the study have really been covered already over the last day and a half. I don't think there's anything terribly controversial here. Um, the, the a lack of, sort of high-level doctrine has already been discussed. The, um, the uh, level of training provided for mentors and advisors prior to deployment um, selection methods, as well as the impact of, of rotation lengths. Um, so I think a lot of those areas have already been discussed, but it was an important study. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the current DST research. Again, it is difficult to, to know where you know, our, our direct support to TAA capabilities um, you know, stops and starts. It's not to say that there's not aspects of, of R&D and force protection, situational awareness in other technology divisions which, which won't be leveraged, but they're not really, they'd be, they'd be, they'd be um, leveraged adventitiously. They're not really directly focused on, on TA missions. So my discussion here is on those aspects of, of DST group support, which is directly focused on to, onto the TAA area. Um, so I mentioned the interpersonal and cultural training earlier. That work is being transitioned to 39 OSB, so they also uh, DST group will no longer have a part in, in, in conducting that training, but our role will be conducting the R&D for that area and <coughs> providing updates over, over time um, as the cultural environments change and, and, those, and perhaps improving based upon what our coalition partners are doing in this space. Um, as I, as I mentioned, I've sort of tried to give an estimate for each of these current areas to give you a sense of what our level of investment is. And to my, my view, like I put one staff here there, it's probably even less than that. So, uh, so, so our investment into these spaces is really quite low in, low in my opinion. Um, one of our staff members, David Matthews, is doing a little bit of work in this space. Um, this is an area of particular interest for this individual. It's a, really a fragile capability, but I thought I'd mention it here, that it is some work which is ongoing. Um, our work in terms, as I mentioned earlier, the, the operational planning of that monitoring evaluation work, this is an ongoing capability that will continue to, to support especially Joint Operations Command. Um, obviously, it won't just focus on TA emissions, but it is a capability which, which will provide significant um, insight into TA emissions. Um, so I'm going to get on to the sort of future. So that's really, as far as I can work out, the sort of overall sum of significant DST investment into really focusing on TA emissions. So I think it's fair to say that it's, it's really not, not, not massive. So it's sort of where shall we be heading from, from here? If this is really important and we really want to, to really push DST's um, focus somewhat away from the, the significant project space more into this area, then you know, what, are the, what are the drivers for where we should be focusing and prioritising our efforts? So I've, I've listed you know, four four areas there which could give us some insight. I mean, clearly this is in no way comprehensive and I just want to give a sense of, of what the, um, of what the uh, drivers to set DST R&D priorities for TA capabilities could be and create some discussion around this. Um, looking at the white paper, there are numerous points there about the importance of capacity building with partner nations. Um, so clearly it's an important area. Um, Picking up on the on the last point there, the Chief of Army sp uh, mentioned this yesterday about you know you know why is defence looking at increasing its its, its um, liaison personnel overseas, and he pointed to the fact that it is about building capacity, um, training, and mentoring with partner defence um, agencies. Um, but the last point there about defence will increase investment in in training should 
should DST Group really be focusing more on training within, the, within this TA space and how to improve the um, training aspects? Um, looking at the, um, the lessons space, um, I've only looked at this adaptive warfare branch report where they've gone through the last six years of lessons from conventional operations. The first, uh, whatever it is, six or eight points there which are in blue, they, they all relate to, to, to training aspects. Um, so again, is, is, is training a driver for, for DST research? You would think that would imply so. Um, the last three points there really relate to the sort of lack of adoption which has been discussed significantly already. Um, this is a US paper um, looking at raising and mentoring security forces in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, these are the six key insights which came from that paper. Um, it's quite a substantial paper, but I think it can be summed down to improving planning and analysis, especially at a strategic level, um, to better understand the interactions and investigate possible second and third order effects, especially with a, with, with a cultural focus, picking up on insights um, four and five there. Um, and the last insight there you know, was the, the US experience was really the uh, requirement to improve monitoring evaluation, which I mentioned earlier, we already have significant expertise in that area and perhaps we can, we can build on that. Um, I mean, obviously DST Group can't do anything, uh, can't do everything. We have a fairly constrained resource, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so I think we need to better leverage our relationships with, with other R&D organisations. So I use the CTTSO here as, a, as an example. Um, they visited recently through the bilateral discussions. I've, I've raised three of their key programs, which I think um, you know, are obviously relevant to, to uh, TAA missions. Um, the first of the, um, there is the holistic approaches to security force assistance and capacity building and developing a how-to guide pick up on Colonel Challoner's point earlier, maybe this is just another piece of um, guidance or doctrine which is adding to the, to sort of, you know, the complicated matting, the sort of mire of, of preparation. But certainly they are, they are looking at developing a, quite a, a guide for practitioners to really guide the, um, the um, planning and, and uh, conduct of these types of operations. So... What's CTTSO? Uh, Counterterrorism Technology Support Organisation or something of that order. <laughs> Counting terrorism. Technical support, Technical support office. Uh, there you go. The, uh, and defence has a bilateral <laughs> arrangement with them, which would be leveraged <laughs> to actually support any collaborative relationship. Um, and they are looking at remote advice and assist assessment and um, support technologies. So again, it could be an area that if there's a, a, a desire to, that you know DST group could help leverage. Um, and also, look, looking at the last dot point there about insider threat situational awareness training, obviously there is a level of overlap between that and the, and the work that Kenny will talk about in the, uh, in the next presentation. So I've, I've gone back and I've, <clears throat> I was thinking about, I went back and looked at some of the client research and development requirements and looking, you know, look, really trying to work out what is the client asking for in this space. And I tried to start looking, looking at, the, at, at the joint requirements and to be honest it was exceptionally difficult. So. I, I went to the Army R&D requirements as a quite a well-contained holistic list of what Army is asking for in terms of R&D support. Um, now obviously this is just a case study and I used the Army's R&D requirements also because, well that's um, <coughs> my significant background as well. Um, so I went through all 250 of their, their client requirements um, and I found, pulled out six of them, like six of them which, which relate significantly to, to, to TA missions. Um, no, training advice assists, those aspects are not mentioned directly anywhere in the, in the 250 requirements, but there are, there are some which I think can be, can be leveraged. Um, so you can read the ones there which, which relate to, to um, improving um, how soldiers operate in different uh, lingual and cultural environments, also the, the selection and screening of personnel and, um, for, for specialist trades. I mean, we could leverage the, these mechanisms to seek support, you know, more significant support from DST Group to improve aspects of selection and training for TA missions if, if there is a push to actually do so. At the moment, that's not really happening because most of the support goes to, into, um, certainly in terms of training for um, improving aspects for training around major projects. 
Um, looking at one of the other AMLIs, the Army Modernisation Lines of Effort, the Army Portfolio Management AMLI. Um, so there is a key question there about what can be done to increase Army's understanding of the rigours and requirements of future operations with respect to assisting the development of future Army force design. And it also mentions specific current force issues. I mean, that is an, that is a, that is an Army R&D requirement which is supported by significant expertise within DST Group. It includes aspects around analysis through the headline program, through limited objective exercises, as well as the land analytical uh, decision support program. From my understanding, talking to the individuals who run those programs, there's never been a question asked of them to, to conduct analysis which relates to, to TA emissions or, S, or SFA emissions. Um, so, but this is an avenue where a group like mine could, could collaborate with these individuals to really start looking at some of these key questions. But at the moment, th those questions aren't really being asked, certainly out of, out of Army headquarters. Um, HMSBA sets the priorities for those, those questions, and are just, are just the reality is that they're not being asked at the moment. So therefore, DST groups not, not analysing them. Um, so what, what I'm saying there is if, if a question gets asked, we have the capability to do it, you know, quite significant studies, look at the pros and cons of different options. I'm not, not advocating any, any specific force design options here. I'm just uh, suggesting that there is the capability to actually support, um, you know, analytical rigour to this process. Um, we look at other Army um, modernisation line, lines of effort, the force, design, the force protection. There's a question there about... Uh, working with other government agencies and restricting access to lethal technology. I think it's clearly relevant here in terms of technology transfer. Under force protection situational awareness in C3, there, there are numerous um, Army R&D requirements which could be leveraged in terms of, especially in terms of um, uh, reducing threat, in terms of increasing protection, but they don't directly relate. Under joint land combat and combat service support, I was unable to find any which have any relationship at all. So as I mentioned, I used, used Army as a, as a sort of case study there. I mean, I, I was unable to really find a, a good holistic set of, of, of joint requirements, but clearly um, I should do that and um, conduct that analysis for the joint client requirements as well. Um, so this is my last slide. So what are the, so from my view, what are the, what are the, um, what should, you know, what are some areas that perhaps we should be focusing more on? Um, this is just my own personal view, but, um, I mean, from, from my own group um, perspective, there's th those first two there are quite relevant um, in terms of improving operational planning, monitoring and evaluation. Um, as I say, we, we do have significant expertise in that space already, and I think we can leverage that going forwards to improve um, you know, more, a better anticipation um, of the ESG operating environment and um, help improve planning in that space. Um, in terms of human train analysis, I think there are, obviously there are significant cultural aspects around planning for, for TAA missions. I think we can improve the way we support our clients in that space. Um, I mentioned earlier that we could, we should be able to, well, we can certainly leverage expertise to conduct um, analytical studies around force design, structural, and organisational questions if there's a desire to do so. Um, I think we should be improving the way we support individual and collective training. Um, there is not, apart from really Kendi's work and the collaboration with, with Deb, there's not a lot of work in, in that space of, of training and selection at the moment. Um, but one thing I think we really need to do is there's a lot of technological research which goes on across DST Group. We're an organisation of about 2,150 personnel who, you know, obviously there's a huge amount of expertise in the technological space. I think we need to get better at leveraging that technology and um, this is perhaps an opportunity to do that as well. Thanks. So Matt, we're in a rare situation with you. You're saying that there is some capacity and expertise. Well, I'm not really saying that there's, there's necessary, well, to actually um, prioritise, you need to, um, that something will have to give. Um, so it's not like that the spare capacity just sitting there. I don't want to give that impression at all. Like we are an overtasked and a, you know, quite a constrained organisation in the, in the budget and staffing cuts we've had over the last several years. But if this is truly a, a priority for our sponsors, we need to find mechanisms to, to, um, to, to better support this space, and that's what I'm pushing here. Thank you for that helpful clarification. Your questions, <coughs> comments and suggestions over here first. 
Uh, g'day mate, it's Sean Parks from RSOCOM. Just as an observation, uh, I was very interested in um, where science actually links in or technology links with the uh, trip, uh, TA mission. And if you look at the third A, and we spoke a little bit about this yesterday about a company and virtual accompanying, with, and I guess of experiences in Iraq, how we actually do virtual accompany as a risk reduction activity for government and in high threat situations like Iraq. Uh, we're actually using technologies uh, with virtual accompanying tools such as civilian applications like ATACS um, and in particular how that links into air land integration and kinetic strike. So I guess there's a focus area uh, for, for your organisation is I guess leveraging with uh, the US, who are also having issues with boots on the ground, um, you know, in terms of their risk reduction activities, how we link some of these technologies into mechanisms for us um, in terms of the TA mission set in the future, and in particular how we leverage uh, civilian um, capabilities to provide to partner forces, um, particularly for the kinetic strike, etc. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, if you're alluding to the fact that we need to collaborate better, and I mean, we, we have stovepipes across our organisation, just like everywhere, I guess, as well. So there's perhaps work going on that I, even I'm not aware of, which could be leveraged. So I, we need to get better at that. We need to get better at forming those relationships. And, and um, I think my, in my division's role, so I guess you're aware that DST Group went through a significant restructure about two years ago. So we centralised all OA support under a single division. I think we have a key role to better leverage expertise both internally to our organisation and outside. And I just think we need to get better at it, but we're just not there yet, to be honest. Um, but I think, does that help answer your question? I'm not sure. Um, it does. I guess, I guess if you're, in terms of as a resource, you have, I guess, organisationally, defence needs to generally use a requirement. And as a, this is ultimately a risk reduction activity done, you uh, in the future, with, in high threat situations, we may say we're not going to, at the end of the day, come and everyone's recognise that, you know, to a degree that generates trust. But I can say from um, personal experience, if you deliver an effect and you support your partner force, that does not mean you need the company, you still generate that trust. So actually technology in the future, as long as that's delivering a, an effect in support of the indigenous force, may actually I agree. It's probably one of those questions which need to be asked <laughs> to you know, really um, lead to a significant study in that space. As I said earlier, like, uh, these questions are not really being asked at the moment and there are mechanisms to really push those sorts of OA studies which could start to you know, inform where our R&D effort should go to support that, that type of, yeah. those types of options. This can be a very good ask, um, oh sorry. <laughs> This can be a very good uh, research requirement. And if you can um, talk to the MLA in AHQ, and uh, we can put in our system to do some study on this. What exactly. do you think, Matt? Um, but there are, there are also, as I said, this, this sort of LADS mechanism, the Land Analytical Decision Support um, Program, is there to actually support you know, really quite short term um, OA turnaround studies of you know, one to three months. So, you know, a short term study which could then lead to more, you know, to more significant research would be the, the avenue I would push in there. Can you just tell us how your mechanism works for prioritising? Okay, well, um, do you really want me to answer that? Uh, under the first principles review, one of the criticisms of DST group was our lack of a holistic prioritisation process. So as good analysts do, we've gone away and developed the most complicated process you can imagine. Um, it's you not working it's so well. Um, but yeah, so we do have a, have a process at the moment where you have both the chiefs of, of our divisions as well as all of the two stars across the Defence Force will have the opportunity to prioritise across our, our program where the investment should go. Okay, because I mentioned this because we have a briefing with Dr Zelinsky, the Chief Defence Scientist, mm -hmm. next week with our senior heads here. And I'm just trying to get a sense of if we say that there are things that 
least the university can help with or help with you, mm. just what the mechanism is to do that. Okay, and there's uh, clearly previously there's always been the client requirements and they have priorities associated with them one, two or three. And Helen can talk to this as well. But to, uh, you can probably talk about that after. But, yeah. Well, we'll just do this question, then we'll go that way, since we're hitting that way, then we'll get that response. And then we'll hold that in mind. This may actually lead into a further question. One of the, the challenges that we see, and if I can follow on from the, the question, is a reasonable question. There is existing technology out there that is enabled to be used. Um, and when questioned how could we harness that within DSTO, the answer comes, we'll do some research and then we'll look at what we have for an R&D option and then we'll do what we, and the bit that wasn't said is then we'll do what we do with everything with DSTO and DSTG is we'll come up with a program whereby we develop an Australian product which we can sell into the market in five years time by which time we'll have withdrawn. How do we actually get DST to deliver science and technology that is required in the field today or in a timely manner? Okay, I think, think the, the Red Wing program is an example where that was achieved. Um, but as I say, it's the only example I could find. Um, how do we improve it? We need, to, we, need to, we need to resource it better. We need to resource the staff. We can't expect the same staff who are the R&D technological experts to also do the contextualisation, tailoring those systems and start to, you know, to do the engagement into the AM, AM, AMSO and so on. Um, we need, I think those staff should come out of my division. We just need to invest in it more. Now, I need the, the support from, from the client space to actually influence my senior personnel within my organisation to achieve that, because at the moment we're not, we're not, as you rightly point out, we don't really resource that, and maybe David can add to this. I mean, obviously Red Wing was a success through the uh, operationally urgent S&T program, but um, how, we, how we leverage um, technologies better and, 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 and source them and so on in a, in a, in a more organised way is something that we really need to look at, but I don't have the answer for you here, sorry not. So I just wanted to offer an observation. I think there's a fundamental dilemma that Matt's um, wrestling with, and that is that nobody actually in the ADF owns TAA Security Force Assistance. And so the way our organisation works is a three-star uh, own something and requests R&D to be done, whether it's in the short-term program or the long-term program. But because nobody owns TAA or Security Force Assistance across the ADF, nobody is at that level requesting um, any significant work to be done in it. So Matt comes here and he, he drinks the Kool-Aid and he sees that there's, there's a real requirement and desire to do some work in here, but when he goes back to his laboratory and his organisation, his masters aren't getting the same level, level of engagement at all. So Matt's got a really difficult job, I must say. Um, so my question to you, Matt, is how are you going to resolve that, that fundamental dilemma? Because you're getting it here from us and everyone in this room, but your two-star and, and the chief defence scientist isn't getting it from a corresponding three-star because nobody owns this problem. Yeah, well, as, as I pointed out, I think I, I need the senior clients to really push, to push this as a, as, as a priority. And I pointed out there are some mechanisms to actually do that. And I looked at the land environment quite specifically. That's my background. And they, they do have, a, I mean, Army really are quite, I think they probably are the sort of leaders in terms of the way they manage their, their, their R&D program. But um, so there is a mechanism to actually support some analysis in this space. Um, but you know, through, you, you could imagine, you know, a, a headline activity looking at different, you know, force design options for Army to better support TA or, you know, SFA operations, but that's never, never been asked. But you could also imagine a shorter um, analytical study. Um, so the issue here is, as Dave Rotley points out, you have the, the issue with, you know, the sort of domain capability managers as well as joint and, the, and, and, and those relationships um, make it more complex. But. I think we just need to get, you know, need to get better at it. Is it a matter to be raised when General Smith's back with us a little bit later on? Am I getting some nods in your direction? I, mean, I suppose what we'll do is, when we get to the end of the day, Brett will do a, what are the issues hanging for us, and this plainly is one of them. Or are you able to help us at this point? Yes. Um, um, Helen Cartledge from um, uh, AHQ, um, embedded in um, uh, Army headquarters. Uh, 
uh, work for the uh, scientific advisor's office. Uh, my job is to managing um, Army's uh, ST requirements. How we um, priori uh, prioritize, uh, DSTO prioritize all research capability uh, um, address Army is we now uh, uh, prioritize our s and uh, effort is based on um, Army, all clients or Navy's uh, priorities. And when in the you know, planning uh, pe period of time, and the Army give us um, their prior priorities, priority one, priority two. And uh, so interestingly, uh, we, I mean, Army now in the uh, new structure, which is start last year, is called Army Leads. And the seven, uh, six Army Leads, and this uh, kind of work is not in part of that. We Army, Army Leads, they um, parked somewhere called uh, Management Portfolio, but they're going to change the name again. And so, to, so it's not really DSTO don't want to address my understanding. Really, Army, you should push this. Like Matt just said, you know, we need Army, our clients, to raise, uh, raise uh, awareness to all three-star CDS, say, hey, we need this to be done. You guys probably realize in, uh, in, in the past we had a uh, downsides of the human performance area. And um, now, because I'm pushing that, so we start uh, taking care of this area. Here is Matt. OK, uh, that's my answer. <laughs> Just, yeah, uh, along the Q&A lines, this is a comment rather than a question. Uh, and notwithstanding the observation by the gentleman up the back and the shopping list of potentialities that Matt presented to us, and a, enhanced awareness of DSTG interactions with the other defence groups and services, we're proposing answers to a question that hasn't been posed yet. And I'll just take us back that perhaps one of the purposes of this conference activity is to pose the question, what is the capability? What is the user requirement? Uh, and if we think in a capability sense, going back to my days in um, uh, land development, uh, what is the operational concept? And until any of those have been identified, chasing answers to a question that hasn't yet been posed or conceived of, we're getting the cart way in front of a horse. I'll just leave that as a comment. Thank you. I am sure together um, with you, we're pleased that Matt has spoken frankly and to some degree fearlessly about the challenges that he's faced. He's laid some things before us that I think that people might individually together want to take up. This is as much time as we're able to devote to this at the present time, but please thank him for his contributions. <laughs>